The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. This is Vince Russo's The Brand. No, basically, one of the things that I was kind of thinking about when I wanted to have you on is that there's not a lot of information in English about the history of Lucha. You can look around, but it's not really something there's a lot of resources for, and people don't really do a lot of interviews about it. So you are probably one of the most prominent people in the history of Mexican wrestling, so obviously you're the guy to go to. So since I had access, I figured I'd bring you on if you were willing to do it, which you were. So Yeah. Uh, you, uh, you were born in Cuba, correct? Right. Uh, how old were you when you left? My mom was born in Cuba. Your mom was born in Cuba. Okay. Yeah. I was born in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Okay. That's not then, Cuba. No, no, that is yeah. not. Well, that, and so then when I was like two years old, um, uh, we moved to Miami. Okay. And then I lived in Miami till I was like about 17 or 18. And then I moved to uh, San Diego. And then from there, I moved to Mexico City. Okay. Because yeah. I was in the military. Okay. What was your childhood like in Miami? You hear about the you you hear about the, the the tough areas in Miami, and I've been to Miami, but I don't know what separates the the badlands from the the good lands. Uh, yeah. Where were you raised, and and how did you get through living in Miami for fifteen, sixteen? Years? Well, I um, let me see. The first place that I lived was in a place called uh, Carroll City. Do you know MVP, the wrestler? Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah he's from the same neighborhood I am from. Uh, so that was a predominantly mostly black and a Cuban neighborhood. Then we moved out of that neighborhood and to, uh, predominantly Cuban neighborhood and, um, uh, Puerto Rican. And basically, um, it was right around the time that, you know, the, the Coke thing just exploded into Miami mm -hmm. before they even knew where it was coming from, how to stop it. Um, nothing they had, they didn't know what was going on and Miami was just flooded you know, with a yay. And so I came from that era. And so that was one of the reasons I basically had to leave Miami and get into the military, you know, mm -hmm. at a very young age, because uh, things were very dangerous at that time down there. Now, how accurate was Miami Vice? It was one of my favorite shows uh, in the 80s. Uh, yeah, it's, it's like, it's, you know, like movies glorify everything. Uh -huh. um, you know, I mean, in Mexico, I met a lot, a lot of cartel dealers and yeah, they live a, an incredibly lavish life, but they're always on the run. They're always afraid. They always have people around them. They're not sure if somebody's going to turn on them. You're not sure if you being in their presence, you're going to get, you know, ambushed by somebody else. It's a, and they all know they're going to die. They're like, well, until that day happen, until I get captured, until I die, I'm going to make as much money as I can and hook up my family. You know what I'm saying? And that's kind of like their mentality. That is awesome. Um, I have seen Scarface probably 30 times. Me and Cornette went to see it at the theater probably four times, just so we could count how many times the F-bomb was dropped. My son has never seen I've never Scarface. I've seen Scarface, yeah. Oh, bro, come on. That's one of the greatest movies ever. Yeah, that, 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 you know, a lot of great lines in the movie. I mean, great lines. Like, there's a, there's a line that Cubans say a lot, which Al Pacino says in the movie. And Al Pacino does a great job of doing a Cuban accent. Just yeah. a perfect Cuban accent. And, uh, you know, he's, the Cubans always say, you know, I only got two things in this life, my word and my balls, and I don't break them for anybody. And he actually uses that line in the movie, and I pop. And yeah. so, you know, it's kind of roughly based on the life of a guy that actually did exist. And, and you would see that, you know, I mean, imagine – here you are one day, you're, you're at school, you're failing, or you're not doing that good, or you don't have good enough grades to go into a good college, whatever, and everybody around you, you know, has nice clothes, has a car, you know, you don't have to really say, you know, what was your last job? We need a recommendation from your last job. You just need a recommendation from somebody that works there and say, hey, this guy's trustworthy. And next thing you know, you're making a lot of money. But of course, like everything else, you know, you're always living in the same uh, paranoia, you know, somebody going to turn on me. What if they catch somebody from our group? Is he going to tell on me? Um, you know, uh, just the same thing. So it, it's, it's a very risky, violent, usually short life because 
you know, not many people stay in the game for long without being caught. Well, now that you've put over Scarface, maybe right. now you will finally I'll watch check it. it out. Out of curiosity, you said that you had to join the military at a young age to get out of the, uh, right. the cocaine epidemic in Miami. Was right. that because you were involved in it or to avoid getting involved in it? Yeah, well, I was never like a, like a yayo dealer, and I was never a gang bang. I was just like a hustler. Like, I could always get whatever you needed if you wanted a gun, if you wanted – you know, back then the quaaludes were like the, were, you know, the big, you know, thing that everybody wanted back then. If you wanted a y little yay, I could get you some yay. You know what I'm saying? So I could get you whatever you needed, you know, yeah. and uh, but it was just a lot of a lot of people that I looked up to were getting locked up or were getting shot. And I was like, it's a matter of time before something happens to me, too. You know what I'm saying? So I need to get as far as I can. So I got into the military. You know, I joined the Navy boxing team. And right. then while I was on the Navy boxing team, I got hurt. And when I got hurt, I got sent on a ship. Okay. Um, one mm -hmm. of the things, and this is an, actually a story about Cornette putting you over. Dad, right. we were having dinner at a Ruby Tuesdays not long ago. And this yes, is going to segue right. into some uh, older Lucha stuff. But right. Dad was talking about how we were talking about Mexican wrestling. And Dad said, well, you know, who was as over as, you know, Rock and Austin in Mexico? And uh, Jimmy said, well, you know, Vampiro and Conan were on that level. But there was guys even above that. He says, you know, those guys couldn't get close to someone like Mil Mascaras. Right. Mil Mascaras jumping on a trampoline, this was Jimmy's exact quote, couldn't pop a pimple on the ass of El Santo, which right. uh, was hilarious. But Dad was unaware of how over you and Vampiro were in Mexico because to him, he just experienced you guys in WCW. He wasn't, he didn't know the cultural aspect of it. Yeah, I was raised totally on Memphis wrestling and then eventually, right. and of course, being friends with Jimmy, whoever he, he had heat with, automatically had heat with right so if he didn't like the entire wcw roster then, then of course i didn't like them either right and that's why I, I, I never spoke to russo for countless countless years and i'd met him in nashville seemed to be a very nice guy and then the next thing i know jimmy hates him well okay well my best friend hates him so i hate him too and then one day chris said well you know what um I got a feeling Russo ain't as bad as jimmy makes him out to be why don't we try and get him on the, the bowling alley and i said well Jimmy will lose his damn mind and he'll never speak to us again. Well, so what? <laughs> so he said, well, let's have him on. If Jimmy wants to end our friendship over something like that, then he wasn't much of a friend anyway. I said, well, all right, I agree with you. Let's see if we can get him on. So it took months to get Russo to agree to come on because <clears throat> he knew it was going to be an ambush. And we had him on. Uh, he finally agreed to come on. As a matter of fact, the crying guy, David Wills, Dave made, Wills it, yeah. made it happen. Still real to me. Still real to me, Dave. And uh, he made it happen. He told Russo that I was a good guy and that I would not ambush him. We'd be fair with him. And he came on. We had a great show. Then Vince had us on his show a couple times. And we've got, you know, man, this is a pretty damn good guy. He's all right. And, uh, and of course, Jimmy loses his mind, doesn't speak to us forever. And But uh, that was when we learned, you know what? Maybe a lot of these guys aren't that bad of guys. You know, maybe it's just Jimmy has heat with everybody on the damn planet. Yeah. And the more people we've met, the more people we got, you know, you know, maybe Jimmy just can't get along with anybody. And now here it's me that he doesn't speak to anymore because I speak to many of the people that, that he did not like. Uh, to get off the Russo subject just yeah. quickly, uh, how did you break into wrestling? I know you said you moved to Mexico City. I was uh, about to ask that too. I was wondering what yeah. year and how you ended up Because you in didn't Mexico. grow up watching it, you said. so. Uh, no, how did I didn't grow up. Basically, it's uh, um, this guy. Like I said, I used to be in the Navy boxing team. My 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 bio my biological father was Puerto Rican, was a boxer. So I wanted to I wanted to um, follow in his footsteps. And um, so I, I used to box, and um, he had seen me training at um, in a park, and he was like, "Hey man, you want to go to Mexico and watch wrestling?" And I was like, "Yeah, no, not really, you know." <laughs> and he was like, "You know." Go, and go. Uh, yeah, I was probably about, uh, I would say, 22. Oh, yeah, wow. Okay. I was 22. And I had a big physique, too, because I had just um, I had just gotten hurt. I had just gotten hurt. I had just gotten a surgery, and I got into bodybuilding. So I was in, in a really good shape. And so this guy was like, yo, do uh, you want to come to uh, Mexico and check out Mexican wrestling? I was like, no. And he was like, well, you like boxing? Yes. He goes, well, Julio Cesar Chavez, Salvador Sanchez. What do you think of those guys? I go, bro, those guys are like the greatest. He goes, well, come watch Mexican wrestling. And so um, he goes, it's the greatest wrestling ever. And 
I don't know. I just guess something about it. Oh, this is what it was. So then the guy went to his car. That's what it was. The guy went to his car and he comes out and he shows me a belt. And he goes, yeah, you know, I'm the world champion. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was like, um, and he had like a limp. And I was like, um, uh, well, what happened? You know, and he was like, <clears throat> yeah, I got into a fight in the dressing room and my legs messed up, but I'm going to be back soon. And, you know, just like Kenny says, you kind of size up a guy. And I yeah. was kind of sizing him up and I go, I'm pretty sure I could probably take this guy, you know. And so uh, he goes, and he's a world champion. I think I could be one. So we went to uh, to Mexico, and that was just you know it's nothing. It was nothing like American wrestling. The fans were more rabid. Oh, yeah. There was seventy times more high flying. You know the cool mask and the capes. It was like a barrage of all these great things at the same time. You know, and then you know I was just like, wow, this is really cool. And so um, we went into the dressing room, and like I said, I was kind of like a bodybuilder back then, so I was much bigger than any guy on the any of the mexican wrestlers so this promoter was like uh um this guy that um the guy that has shown me his belt he tells the promoter yeah this guy's wrestled before and the guy turns around and uh the guy says don't say nothing just say you've wrestled before and he goes where have you wrestled before well i wrestled in miami and he was like oh really who did you wrestle and i just remembered wrestlers from miami and i told him he goes all right you're booked for next week Wow. <laughs> I was like, I was like, what? Yeah. I so, didn't realize that Conan's a bigger liar than I am. <laughs> and I've yeah. been lies for 50 years. About but then, you. but it didn't really turn into a lie. This guy kind of put me on the spot and I had to kind of like help him out. Wow. And so he was like, yo, so I was like, well, what am I going to do when I hit the ropes? What if I fall through the ropes and the people laugh at me? He goes, no, just go in there and just knock them out like a regular boxing match. And I was thinking, well, why hasn't anybody done that before? You know, I mean, like, you know what I'm saying? So to make a long story short, we get to the we get to the arena, and he had actually put me in the first match as the Incredible Hulk. And I was like, I got, I, I was like, bro, I got nervous. I was like, bro, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And I kept thinking, what if I go through the ropes and everybody laughs at me? So I said, look, I'm not gonna go up there unless you bring me to, to train. So he said, all right. So the next Monday, he brought me to train. And Ray Mysterio Jr.'s uncle, Ray Mysterio Sr., yeah. was an actual world champion at that time. And he saw me and he goes, are you the guy that said that you wrestled in Miami before? <laughs> and I go, yeah. And he goes, who do you wrestle? And I go, well, I really never wrestled anybody. He goes, why are you going around making up a lie? Oh, God. I go, well, because my manager told me to. He goes, <laughs> manager? How many, ma how many matches have you had? And I go, none. And you have a manager? And I go, <laughs> yeah. And I go, yeah, it's the world. I go, yeah, it's the world champion, John Roberts. And he goes, who? And I go, yeah, right over there, John Roberts. He goes, that's not the world champion. That's a fan. Oh, so a fan no. Some oh. fan had worked me that he was like a world champion, you know, and just to get me to go to watch a wrestling match. And that's exactly how I got into the business. That is one of the damnedest stories I've ever about, heard in my about life. About what year was that? This was like 88 or 89. So in 88 or 89, it would have been UWA and EMLL would have been the two major companies, right? Right. UWA. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I never got in professionally until I got hired by Nick Goulas in 87. Right. So you and I are pretty damn close. Right. We're contemporaries. Only I didn't tell Nick Goulas that I'd managed Nick Bockwinkle. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I, bro, I didn't even expect to go to the wrestle what, either. I just went as a fan. Hired, what got me hired is I told him that my two best friends in the business were Jerry the King Lawler and Jimmy Cornette. And uh, he says, well, I can see a little bit of Jerry Lawler in you. I'm going to make you the next Jerry Lawler. I said, well, I prefer to talk and manage. I said, I don't know if I want to take those bumps every night all across the country. And he, all right, well, I can use one of them too. So he hired me and gave me my start. And then eventually I ended up helping Jimmy out and Smokey Mountain a little bit. And then got hired by Danny Davis and stayed there for 18 years. And then I re retired from OVW and just been doing podcasting since about 2000. Oh, what about eight, I guess, 2008. And, started. and uh, that's, you know, um, but, but I love your story. <laughs> it's great. Cause I was wondering how it got from the point to where, yeah, I wrestled Miami and you named all the guys you'd wrestled to. I need training. <laughs> I yeah. How it got from that point to the next point. 
so did you uh, start training with Ray Senior for quite a while after that, or was it more in between shows? Or bro, it was the craziest thing. I'm gonna tell you something. You're not even gonna believe it, bro. People just, I was like I said, I was so much bigger than everybody, and I kind of changed the game because back then everybody was wearing like black tights, gray tights, white, like basic colors, yeah, and yeah. I started wearing Miami colors, fuchsia, orange, turquoise. You what know, and I wasn't, and I wasn't, and I wasn't wearing like. Uh, long tights i was wearing like tights up, up to my knees you know okay. yeah. and so i was just like bro i was just like this real big deal before i even started to wrestle you know i was on magazine covers and so when i went to toreo which is uwa yeah i debuted in toreo having imagine this i debuted in toreo in the main event having maybe a year and a half in the business you know, uh, with like Connect, Fishman, Dos Caras, you know, Villano 3, you know, guys that were like some of the greatest wrestlers in the world yeah. and had been in the business for many years. But I was a, I was like a big draw from the minute that I came into the business and I always stayed on top. So I was very, very, very fortunate. Wow, that Can, is awesome. Bringing up Connect, he's one of those guys that around that America, I feel like there's not a lot of people who are even aware of him, but was such a big draw, was such a big deal, and was so instrumental in bringing a lot of the Western talent into Mexico. It's become kind of a thing that AAA has done. I know when you were booking in AAA, you had a lot of American talent come in. He was the first guy to really start, as far as I know, you might be able to correct me on this, to start bringing in American talent and working them, or whoever was running UWA at the time. But I know that Connect had the matches with uh, Yokozuna, with uh, Hulk Hogan, with quite a few outside guys. Yeah, well, CMLL had always, you know, CMLL was the first company. And they used to bring in a lot of American wrestlers back in the day yeah. because that's, you know, that's mainly, mainly where Mexican wrestling really came from, American wrestling, where it had been seen in El Paso. And um, uh, but what happened was since the Mexicans were like smaller in stature and in weight, they invented like their own quick, fast style. But um, uh, CMLL had always brought in Lutez and a whole bunch of other guys. But Connect, you know, UWA was the first one that started to bring over like Inoki and Fujinami and B Big Bam Vader and Andre the Giant and Hogan and all that. And all of them were just basically for Connect to beat, you yeah. know. Yeah. And Connect was doing that as a Rudo, correct? Yeah. And so it was very hard to get over on Connect because let me tell you something that he would do. When I was a baby face and he was a heel and I would go for his belt, you know, the people would always be cheering for him. And I was like, Jesus, this guy's supposed to be the heel. But then I found out why, because like they would send me home so I wouldn't be able to wrestle the foreigners and they would turn him baby face when the heels were in town. Then anytime the heels left, then he went back to being a, 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 a heel. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, the first belt, like I, I grew up around, you know, Smoky Mountain, WWE, OVW, and I always thought the belts were kind of uh, cheesy looking. Right. And the first belt that I remember seeing and thinking, wow, that looks like something that, you know, you would want to win. Like that looks like a prize with the United right. titles. Right. The big silver with the gold trim. I always thought those were just beautiful yeah. looking belts. They were. They looked very, very nice. Yes. So you were in UWA for how long? I was in UWA for about. Uh, a year and a half. And then when I was there, um, I remember I, I was, I was having problems with connect because every time the foreigners would come, I would, they would always send me home and I wanted to wrestle the foreigners. That was number one. And number two, in one year we had, uh, I had challenged him for his belt three times, including Tijuana, which was like where I come from, you know what I'm saying? Where I started. Okay. So now we were going to do a fourth match in one year. And a couple of the wrestlers were like, look, if he beats you again, you know, it's going to hurt you a lot. You've already lost three times and you've still maintained your drawing power four times in one year. He goes, you know, uh, you know, you can't lose again. So I went and they said that um, that it would be a draw. And I said, well, why don't you just give me the belt? And they said, no, the best we can do is give you a draw. And I just told them, all right, well, you know, this is my last day here. And the guy was like, well, I can't believe that we're giving you a chance that nobody's ever had. You know, you know who you're wrestling with? You're wrestling with Connect and Fishman and this guy and that guy. And you're only 23 years old and you just started. And I was just so, so confident and full of myself that I was like, well, I really don't care. I'm leaving. And so we went there and we did a draw. And I remember the people started to chant my name. This is how ballsy I got. I got on the mic 
And I was like, yeah, well, why don't we just, you know, why don't we give the people another five minutes and really see who the real champion was? And I was so, I don't know, unprofessional and in my head that like if he would have done in another five minutes, I probably would have tried to shoot, beat him. You know what I'm saying? Because I was mad. I was really mad. And so, and I'll tell you another story. Stu Hart had once the first place that I ever wrestled, even before I went to Mexico City, was Canada. And Stu Hart had called me because one of his sons saw me wrestling in Hawaii for Liam Mayavia with, uh, with uh, Mondo Guerrero. Okay. So Stu Hart calls me and he's like, yeah, can you come up here to uh, Calgary? He goes, uh, but you're going to have to drive up here. And, and I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to drive. You know, if you want me to go over there, you're going to have to fly me over there. Now that I think about it, Stu must have thought this guy's got some balls on him. Who the hell was he? He's a nobody. And he's telling me to fly him up to Calgary. And I'll tell you why that makes uh, what gives validity to the story. Do you remember a guy, uh, Kenny? I don't know if your son would remember him called Curtis Thompson. He's from like Georgia. Yeah. Sorry, like breaker chip yeah. or whatever. Oh, yeah, I remember him. All right. Well, he was in Calgary. All right. And he okay. told me he drove his car from Georgia to Calgary. Oh, my. Yeah. Oh, God. So, you know, Stu must have been thinking, this guy's got a lot of balls. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and you were just 23 then? Yeah. See, when I got in, I was 27. And it right. took about seven years to develop any type of balls whatsoever. Right. Just up to promotion and tell them what you thought. So, yeah, it's pretty damn impressive. Yeah. And so then from there, Arena Mexico, I went to Arena Mexico. And I got very lucky because TV had been deemed violent and wasn't on, uh, wasn't, they weren't showing Mexican wrestling for 35 years. Yeah. There'd been no wrestling. It was deemed too violent. I got to arena Mexico just as they got the TV back. And that's when the big explosion of Vampiro, Conan, Octagon, Perro Aguayo, you know, this humongous explosion. I was getting ready to ask when you got tied in with Vampiro, because uh, Jimmy really puts over, uh, just how big the two of you guys were over there. Yeah, bro. Vampiro was so over that. Now imagine this. I've only maybe seen this with Matt with Jeff Hardy, maybe. I don't know if there's another guy, but where girls are coming to the arenas dressed like you. Yeah. Oh my God. No. That's that's other level popularity. You know I what I'm saying? I didn't they were doing that with Matt Hardy. That's with Jeff. Wild. Hardy, with yeah. Jeff, Jeff. Yeah, the arm band. We're, we're, you know, with the band and the but I'll tell you why, because I went to TNA once. When I was in TNA, like in 2006, uh, Matt, you know, when they would come out of the, when they would come out of the TV tapings, the fans knew like where the wrestlers, you know how it is. The fans always find out like the hardcore fans, like where your car is and where you got to go through to get to your car. And there'd always be like a whole bunch of fans waiting for Jeff. They were dressed with the, with the armband. They had their face painted you know, their hair, whatever color he had it. And then he would go over there and they would sing his songs together. And I was like, wow, that's some other type of popularity. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. That, that fans knowing where the cars is apparently goes way back. Cause that, that was how I met Jerry Lawler. We'd mm -hmm. hang in the back alley and then we'd see where the wrestlers would park at. But uh, the heels were such heels back then. Sam Bass spoke to me probably a year before Jerry Lawler did. Uh, mm -hmm. And he was the heel manager, but uh, he was actually pretty um, uh, intermingling with the fans back backstage or back in the alley waiting for the wrestlers to go in. But uh, Jerry held pretty uh, status quo until Jimmy Hart actually introduced me to him long before Jimmy Hart ever started managing Jerry. Right. So Arena Mexico at the time, that would have been EMLL, correct? Right. Uh, how long would you stay in EMLL? I stayed there maybe... Uh... 91, 93. I don't know. I would maybe two years. And then that led to you going to AAA, which is where you really started to right. become more known over here. Yeah. So then, yeah. And then I left there too. Again, um, uh, Antonio Pena, who to me was a creative genius. He was, um, he had come up with all these guys, you know, Volador, Misterioso, Mascara Sagrada, Octagon, you know, Conan, and the old school guard in the office was fighting him. He wanted to push all these new stars. And so I remember one day he told me in Octagon, he was like, you know, I have a chance to start my own promotion. And uh, if it fails, 
we're never going to be able to come back here. And you guys are as hot as anybody's ever been. And me and Octagon were like, yeah, well, wherever you go, we'll go. You know, we followed him and we started AAA. Who was the old guard at that time in the MLL that you uh, couldn't get pushed past? Well, basically what it was is there was a, a guy, he was kind of like the booker. His name was Juan Herrera. And he took care of like this special group of guys from Guadalajara which is the second biggest city in Mexico and where a lot of the great wrestlers came. So, you know, he was taking care of Rayo de Jalisco. He was taking care of Atlantis. You know, he was taking care of um, uh, uh, a, a Dandy, uh, Cien Caras. Um, he was taking care of that, what was the Guadalajara clique, uh, like the older guard. And, um, and so, you know, you know, we were young and we, and, and I like, like, for example, me again, I knew it was my time, you know, and I was like, I know wherever I go, I'm going to do good because that's the self-confidence I had in myself. And so, um, you know, it was a right move because I exploded even bigger in AAA. Yeah, and AAA became very prominent. But Chris, what, Chris, what year did we start watching AAA when we got hooked on all the Mexican wrestling? That was after WCW died. Uh, the Mexican networks in Louisville started to play an hour and a half of CMLL and I think two hours of AAA every Saturday and Sunday. And that was how I got introduced to it, was I was seeing guys like Atlantis, who is still wrestling today, amazingly. Um, I would see Rey Mysterio when he went back to CMLL after WCW ended. Uh, Psychosis was working as Nicho Millionario. Is that where I saw Sanjay Dutt for the first time? No, that was uh, MLW out of That Florida. was MLW, okay. Um, but no, we and we started to see more of these guys, and I got more exposed to it. And that's when I started to become more of a fan and more aware of it. Uh, Cybernetico was a guy that I saw quite a bit of. But uh, back to the uh, AAA thing, you guys, when Worlds Collide happened and then the WCW deal happened and you were negotiating the WCW deal, correct? You were kind of the guy. Right, that right. Mm -hmm. that. right. Um, I've, heard, I've heard a lot of stories that Eric Bischoff uh, was frustrated by the amount of power that you carried with those guys. Is there any truth to that? Well, I don't think it's power as much as, uh, you know, we just had developed a good friendship, you know, and they trusted me and, um, you know, I always fought for them. You know, we were always fighting, you know, like Eric wanted to make sure that Ray Mysterio took his mask off and I tried to explain to him all the reasons he shouldn't yeah. and he didn't care. And it almost came to the point where he was like, you know, it's either you're either going to do it or you're going to get fired type of deal. And we were both making a lot of money and he had just had his first kid. And I remember that he was so afraid of Eric that when his kid was going to be born, he was like, man, I'm not even sure if I should go home because I might get fired. And I said, bro, if they fire you, we all quit. And I yeah. think that's the type of stuff that the guys liked about me where Eric and I'm not trying to I have no more heat with him. We did have heat, but, you know we all make mistakes and it is what it is. But, uh, you know, I think Eric wasn't a real people person, you know, and he was, could be very aloof and he would only hang out with like Hogan or Nash or Hall or like the big stars and everybody else he really didn't care about. And he, you know, he, he was, you know, it wasn't like Paul Lee. Like I'll give you an example. Paul Lee was like, he talked to the, when I was in ECW. Okay. Paulie would talk with the top guy and he talked to the bottom guy. You know what I'm saying? He made everybody feel important. He knew how to treat wrestlers. That's why he got so much out of them. And that's something that I actually learned from him. That's how I get so much out of my wrestlers. You hug them, you talk to them, you're, you're, uh, um, uh, what do you call this? Uh, interested in what they have genuinely interested in what they have to, uh, you know, because they're working for you, bro. They're the ones that are making money for you, you know, and they're going to go the extra yard. Uh, what was the reason Bischoff gave you for wanting to take his mask off? Because he, even I would have, you know, but little I know uh, about that history would say that is idiotic. So what? what was I think at that point it was just like a pissing off contest between me and him because I'd really pushed his buttons a lot. And right. uh, so, you know, uh, you know, I remember one time me, Hall and Nash had so much heat. He was like, yeah, I'm going to send you guys to the most remote part of Canada. And he said some city and Scott goes, cool. We're over there. You know, we're over in that city. You know, like he always had a line for everything, but I got the, I got the most heat because I had the least of the name of the three. You know what I'm saying? And he was like, why is this guy even opening his mouth? He's not a star. And in my mind, it was like, doesn't matter if I'm a star, I'm not a star, you know, you're going to respect me. And that's all there is to it. So we were always bumping heads, you know? And I remember I explained to him, I go, Eric, look, First of all, you're going to get a weight, bro. Let, let me explain to you how ridiculous the stipulations was. Cause I don't even know if you remember this. 
Rey Mysterio put his mask up against, okay? It wasn't even Nash's hair. Elizabeth, wasn't it? it was a, right. It was Elizabeth's hair. <laughs> what were the chances of that happening? How believable was that? Yeah. I go, all right. So you're going to put this kind of implausible storyline where nobody thinks Ms. Elizabeth's going to lose her hair, where you could have a match between Rey Mysterio and Juventud Guerrero, who are probably two of the 10 top workers in the world at this moment. They're about the same age. They have a backstory. One's the son of a wrestler. The other one is the nephew of a wrestler. And they both wrestled in AAA. You have an incredible backstory with a match of the year. And you're going to do this. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And you better do what I tell you to do. You know, and, blah, blah, blah. and so I was like, you know what? I'm making so much money. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm going to end up getting fired over this. Just know? this one story alone tells me that Eric Bischoff and myself had not gotten along very good at all. Right. Uh, I don't, you know, if you can't listen to your people, and especially when you know a hundred times more about this than he does. Right. That's how you get successful. You surround yourself with good people that are knowledgeable in areas that you're not. Yeah. And you are giving him this and he's just all over it. And that, right. that not fly with me. I, Be because we, at that point, yeah, at, at that point it wasn't about logic. It was about power. It was him demonstrating to me, you know, I'm the boss, not you. And you're not going to tell me what to do. But you know That's what cool. came across on television though. You could tell that Hall, Nash, and Hogan were about all he hung with and that everybody else was beneath him and, and was a doormat for him. That, that yeah, well, he'd hang out with Rodman. If you were a big star, I'd hang oh, out oh, with you. But, of course. you know, at the end of the I'd day, like, I, yeah, like, bro, I hung out with him too, and that's a crazy cool mother. <laughs> and so uh, at the end of the day. The only basketball star my son ever wanted to meet, he's watching me watch basketball with the Bulls, and he's seeing this tattooed guy running up and down the court with green hair and fighting with everybody on the court. He said, who's that? I said, Chris, that's the worm. And next, it, it, anytime he's watching, he's seen me watch about dad is the worm on. Yeah. The worm's playing. Cause I mainly watch the bull bro. And he I, loves the worm. I bumped into him twice, twice at an after hours, one in Las Vegas and one in San Francisco. Okay. The first time it was with two superly hot strippers. Right. Oh. And he was actually, Hey, why don't you come over and hang, hang out with us? And I actually was leaving the club to catch a plane. Right. And I was like, bro, I wish I could, but I can't. You know, I, I had to cancel that flight. <laughs> and here's the other one. Here's the other one. This is awesome. <laughs> he was at some like, was some sort of fetish festival club, something like that. No, and he far. was he he was with a. I'm not kidding, bro. He was with at least a six foot five like tranny. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but looked like a woman. But looked I know like what a the woman. Is, yeah, at six yeah. five. Yeah. <laughs> Holy oh, mackerel. Course. Yeah. Worm, worm, worm wasn't too discriminate. In, in, nah, but he's a cool dude. Uh, as a matter of fact, he got over with us. We saw him on the Jay Leno show and Chris and I, the first nice headphones we ever had were called monster diamond tears, but we didn't really see celebrities pushing them or anything. It was just something that we just discovered by accident Very good and, a, and a sponsor bought them for us. They were like three seventy nine a set held eight years ago. And so we thought we were the only three people that had them, the three that were doing the bowling alley back then. And I'll be damned if the worm doesn't show up on the Jay Leno show and he's got on a pair of black diamond tears, just like Chris wears, not plugged in anything. He was just wearing them as jewelry around his neck. He wore them around Kim Jong-un, which I thought was. Very yes. And he wore them around. And, uh, and of course he's uh, Kim Jong uh, just uh, loves and adores the worm. He can go over there and have a meeting. He ain't afraid to go to North Korea and just get superly drunk. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, can you imagine the stupid stuff he does when he's drunk in North Korea, but yet lives to get on a plane and come home and talk about it? Never winds up in the salt mines. Name me another human that could pull that off. He's too much. That's for damn sure. But the one thing I wanted to tell you, so getting back to Bischoff, I just try not to drag resentment and bitterness with me because it's almost like it's like giving medicine to a dead guy. You know, I mean, it, there's no effect. Me being mad at him doesn't bother him at all. And at the end of the day, it was what it was. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I just keep it 100. How did, how did y'all patch things up? Coincidentally enough, I had seen him. I had seen him in WWE. I had gone there to uh, try out as an announcer. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he kept like avoiding me. And then we finally like came face to face and I put out my hand. I almost uh, I put out my hand and he like forcibly gave it to me. Uh -huh. And I was like, you know, I'm trying to get a job, so I'm not going to go off on him right there. 
Yeah. So I was thinking to myself, whenever I see this guy again, I'm really going to let him have it. And out of the blue, his producer for some show that he has a podcast too, or I don't know if he still has it. I uh, think he, huh? I think he does. He still does. Yeah. Okay. So the producer just reached out of blue and he goes, yeah, Eric wanted to know if he could be a guest. And I was thinking to myself, I'm not going to ambush this guy, but if he in any way, any way starts anything, it's about to go down and like really go down. And, uh, but he came on the show and he was a gentleman and he was respectful. So, you know, I was cordial with him too. You know what I'm saying? And I just let it go at that. By any chance, did you see the table for three with him and Cornette? And who was the third one? Um, Hayes. Michael Hayes. No, I, I did not. Uh, it really came Is that the one where they bury Russo? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. they bury yeah. Russo on there. And that was supposedly how Jimmy and Bischoff patched up their differences is because they both hate Russo. Right. And, uh, and at the end of it, the most awkward thing I've ever seen was, um, what was it, Chris, to where Jimmy wanted- he put over Bischoff and then he said, well, what about me? Aren't you going to say something nice about me? And then Bischoff barely even acknowledged anything nice Bischoff, about Jimmy. Bischoff buries people at a high level. Like and, he's very but that, was the, the, that was the best thing yeah. he ever did is that he made Cornette beg him to put him over, which Bischoff really did not do. And I called Jimmy. I said, Jimmy, you made yourself look like a little bitch trying to get to begging Bischoff to put you over. You made the sad mistake of putting him over first. And now he doesn't have to put you over because you, you've already stepped out on the plank. There, right. there, you were in a no-win situation. So is there some sort of heat between Bischoff and Cornette? There not was, not anymore. There was for years, but I think it's oh, yeah, this, this thing went on. Oh, he hated Bischoff as bad as uh, Russo. It was Bischoff, Russo, name them, Chris. You know them all. Bischoff, Russo, the guy in Tennessee that he ran over. Um, yeah. Wasn't he a wrestler? Yeah, he was a wrestler. I can't think of his name, though, but he ran uh, over. Landell, it was a. Yeah. Uh, the chick from Dairy Queen. <laughs> yeah, the chick from Dairy chick Queen. Chick from Dairy Queen. Um, what other. Uh, Austin Aries. And Santino. <laughs> uh, Kevin Santino. Owens. Red Rooster. <laughs> Derry Taylor for a while. Yeah, well, he's got he with me. And uh, please, if I'm on my show, we have this edict. If you say Terry Taylor, you must say Terry the Stooge Taylor. But we're not on my show. But I thought I'd bring that up. <laughs> In your honor, Terry, Terry the, the Stooge, Stooge Taylor. Taylor. Yeah, there, there you he go. never did anything for me. Yeah. Terry the Stooge Taylor. I know at some point in the 90s, you <clears> left uh, AAA for Promo Azteca. What led up to that? Uh, what had happened in AAA is that I started the. Uh, I was very heavily influenced by what I saw in ECW. And I thought that's something that we could capitalize on in, in Mexico. Cause I could see the reaction of the people in Mexico watching it for the first time. And I was like, bro, we can make money with this. And so I had a real young crew that actually loved that style too. You know, Ray Mysterio, Psychosis, you know, um, all those guys, La Parca, Forza, uh, Juventud Guerrera, you know, they all loved it too. And so everywhere we were doing it, we were doing incredible business. And the older established guys, Perro Aguayo, Fuerza Guerrera, Octagon, they hated it. You know, they were like, what are you doing? So there kind of was like a rift in between the old school guys and the new school guys. And I was just like, uh, you know, they just felt I had too because I was also writing the shows with Pena. Yeah. And the wrestlers were like, he's got too much power. He's writing the show. He's the number one draw. You know, he's sending wrestlers to ECW. You know, he's he's running Tijuana. He's got his own office over there. You know, he doesn't hardly use us, you know. And Pena would be like, well, why don't you use them? I go, bro, because they're not that good anymore. And they, and they charge a lot of money. And if I don't have a good show, they're not going to help me. These young cats, if I do, if I don't, if I do have a bad show, they will help me. Thankfully, I haven't had any bad shows because extreme wrestling is super over. I mean, there was a time in Mexico that there probably were about four or five shoot companies just dedicated to extreme wrestling. Even to this day, where extreme wrestling is kind of passe in the United States, extreme mm -hmm. wrestling still gets over on shows in Mexico. So mm -hmm. there was another television station called TV Azteca, the second largest network in Mexico. They were starting a new uh, TV show and they were like, Hey, if you come over here, we'll let you write the show and pick all the talent. So I went over there and brought all the young talent with me, plus other talent that I discovered and started that. Yeah. But then there came a point where Eric was like, well, you have to make a decision, either Mexico or United States with, and it was funny. Cause at one point he was actually going to buy the promotion. But anyway, so once he said you had to leave the promotion, we all had to leave. Oh man. 
How yep. much of that influence? How much of that affect your income? Losing. Uh, yeah, it affected my income. Plus, it affected the fact that I always had a place to go back to, in case something happened in WCW. So he took all that away too. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm doing good right now. So you're about to start booking Arola, Arolucha. Right. What's the yeah, story? The news came out with that this week. It said that you were right in the pilot, Conan. Is that correct? Right. So basically, what it was is just Don and Ron Harris. You know, I'm sure you know them. Yeah. 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 You know, they obviously saw the you know the biggest minority in the United States is Latinos, and they're underserved. Even though Lucha Underground is out there, they haven't really done a great job of you know touring. Um, and their TV is very limited. Let's face it. You know, El Rey gets, I think, the most maybe 150,000 viewers. I maybe 200 at the most for for um, for um, Lucha Underground. Right. Um, so, you know, uh, their idea was to have a touring Lucha company because Lucha is very over. I mean, almost there's something funny. One of the wrestlers right now, his name is Phoenix. He's one of the most in-demand wrestlers right now in the world. Brother of uh, Pentagon Black. Right? Brother of Pentagon, right. And uh, um, so they had jumped over to Crash from AAA. He told me, he goes, it's incredible. Everywhere I wrestle, this kid wrestles literally everywhere. He goes, they always want to have a Lucha match. You know, 25 years ago when I first brought Lucha to WCW, since nobody knew what it was, nobody was having Lucha matches. Right. To go from nobody even knowing what it was to every place, whether it's Chile, Peru, London, whatever wants to have a lucha match that's pretty cool it, it reminds me a little bit and i'm not comparing it in scope to like hip-hop you know hip-hop was just a thing that you know started in new york and then you know it was la and miami and then it went everywhere now it's global you know what i'm saying and it's almost like lucha's the same way one thing that uh i was thinking about, i actually wanted to discuss this with you it's odd to me because i feel like the most influential wrestler isn't he's a luchador but he's not a mexican luchador but if you look at the progression of wrestling in the main event styles if you look at guys like seth rollins if you look at guys like Sami Zayn, uh dean ambrose a lot of these guys who are working in these lucha not necessarily lucha psychology but a lot of lucha moves a lot of lucha progressions right ultimo dragon has changed the business so greatly i'm not sure if you know him too well uh, he was in WCW. Yeah, i know him very well i remember when he first came to mexico he came as part of a trio called uh, uh, sano uh, uh nato acai and sano or something like that and he was acai before yeah. he was Ultimate Dragon. He was yeah. incredible. When when he was young, he was incredible. Yoshihiro Asai, yeah. Is, yeah, uh, yeah he, he's fantastic. And his school, Torimon, which I don't know if it's even still running down there or not. but Yeah, Toriyuman. Uh, yeah, yeah. Tori, yeah, the guys that he trained uh, have changed the business and the way that it works so much. If you look at New Japan's main event scene with Okada, he's an Ultimo Dragon guy. That style, the way that they, uh, the way that the bigger men are presented, that's become the standard in most wrestling that I see anywhere. Right. And that all comes from Mexican wrestling. Yeah, and it's what he took and what he kind of some of the stranger gimmicks that have kind of come around, but he's modified that in the way that it's kind of gone with a more stiffer style. It's interesting to see that this guy, who I think that a lot of the younger fans aren't really even too aware of anymore, he's kind of been forgotten by history, at least by the Americans. Right. It, it's interesting to see what he's done and how that's progressed. But I've always been a huge fan of Ultimo Dragon and especially that Tori Uman style. I love the guys like Seema, Magnum, those guys. That's kind of what brought me back into wrestling after I got out. A of lot it. of those guys were in WCW. Remember, they were like young boys there. Uh -huh. Yeah, they would have Sua and uh, Seema. And, those <laughs> that, guys, and, right? and Dragon brought them in. Yeah, and uh, Tokyo Magnum teamed up with. Uh, right. Uh, oh, yeah. Like Tokyo brought his young guys and I brought my young guys. You know what I'm saying? Except yeah. for the Vianos who weren't young. But, um, yeah. you know, but I brought my young crew, too. Yeah. I have I have a question for you. This has been just I've always wondered this. Uh, you remember when Jericho left WCW and they made the big monster debut on on Monday night? right with the Rock? Tell me this. Um, what did, to my knowledge, Juventud Guerrero is the only person to have his name mentioned on Raw that didn't work for the company, right? Uh, or or at least not from a past sense. So he's currently right. working somewhere else. What did he think about having his name dropped on that show by the Rock that night? Oh my God, hey, bro! Have you ever met Juventud? I have not. All right, you must have him on your show. He's oh, one okay. of a kind. Yeah, He's one of a kind. Um, put in a good word for us, and I'm that would be yeah. a I'd love person you, I would yeah. love to have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, But how how did he handle? And so, that? well, I'll tell you exactly how he handled it. From then on to this day, yeah, he doesn't do it all the time, 
but he'll 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 grab the mic and he'll say, "Finally, the juice has come back to," and he'll say, "The city that you're in." He's awesome. <laughs> oh Lord, the uh, yeah. now is he is he still working today? Oh, yeah, 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 he's still a great worker. Though. Yeah, him yeah. and him and Ray and Psychosis to me, yeah. they really really revolutionized you know high fly wrestling and i'll put eddie guerrero in there too oh god i love eddie eddie come down and helped us out a lot at ovw and you talk about a class act uh, uh i love eddie he was a damn yeah. man. uh sat in the locker room with, with who like you said from the top to the bottom nobody was too low nobody was too high and uh asked other people their ideas uh, if he was going to work a match with one of the ovw boys he got their input and was just an ultimate class act. And man, I really miss uh, the interaction with him. I didn't know him real well, <clears throat> but every time he was down here, man, he was a class act. Yeah. Yeah. And he was special, one of a kind as a person and as a wrestler. Yeah. I can't argue with that. I always ask this question to people who come on, who have been in a position like you are of kind of promoting and booking. Who do you think are some of the guys that should have made it in America that didn't the, the Mexican talent who should have gotten over over here, but never really got a shot or didn't get what they had to. Who and two should have gotten over, you know, uh, psychosis should have gotten over. I mean, really, truly some of the greatest workers to me that have ever come out of Lucha Libre, they should have definitely gotten over. I think uh, Silver King should have gotten over. La Parker should have gotten over. I love La Parker. Um, okay. Yeah. One of my favorites. One yeah. Of my... yeah. And so guys that never even made it to WCW, Negro Casas is Negro. one of them. Yeah. He's so sharp and smooth, even to this day. And he's been around for a long time. His yeah. movements are just so. Bro, you needed to see him when he was young. He was on a whole nother level. Um, Fuerza Guerrero, Juventud Guerrero's dad, when he was young, was on a whole nother level. The bumps he took were ridiculous. Nobody in the United States was taking those bumps. La Fiera, another guy who passed away, he was taking ridiculous bumps. Jerry Estrada was incredible. There was a lot of guys. It's almost like, imagine, imagine if Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero would have never come to the United States, you would have never even known they existed. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of guys like that that never made it here. Mm -hmm. You know, now... Now with the social media, now, you know, nobody gets left behind. You know what I'm saying? That now, it, you know, it's pretty hard if you're real talented to stay hidden. Uh, if, why, why do you feel Hoobintude never uh, was just Bischoff didn't believe in him and just didn't get the opportunities? Or what do you think? Well, no, he didn't believe in any of the cruiserweights because, right. you know, Chris Jericho, Eddie Guerrero, they, Rey Mysterio, they all had to go to WWE to be a star. Yeah. That just proves that no matter what you say about Vince, he knows what a star is, you yeah. know, because he's, he's made more than anybody else. You know what I'm saying? So well, he, did try, he did try to cut uh, John Cena, though. He, he, did, he did not see Cena with any talent and wanted to let him go. Yeah, well, I could see that at the beginning. I wasn't a big John Cena fan either. You know what I'm saying? And he, and he never, I, I never, he never resonated with, I was more like in, he never resonated with me. But then yeah. again, the I'm not his demo. You know what I'm saying? Like right. his demo were like, you know, young kids. You know yeah. what I'm saying? When he and, got here, he, he was a heel with Rico Constantino. Right. He got here. I just didn't see any way he could possibly miss. And that was, and that was still based on very limited wrestling ability. Right. I his promos and personality were going to carry him through. It's not like Hulk Hogan was known for being the world's greatest wrestler. Right. Now, I thought personality in that alone. And, and, and not often that me, Cornette and Danny Davis always agree on a talent, but from day one, we looked at each other and said, you know, th th this guy's just waiting for the day that he becomes a multimillionaire. He's a, uh, He's got it made. When you have an eye for talent, you know, you know it. You know what I'm saying? You know when the per – because I even I even think to myself, bro, imagine – well, and imagine, uh, for example, like when Vampiro first arrived in Mexico and Pena was really the guy that pushed him. You know, Pena's probably thinking – now, here's the thing. Pena was uh, homosexual, okay? So he was real good at finding guys that knew – that he knew not just women would like, but other guys would like, you right. know what I'm saying? And so he saw something in Vampire that not even I saw, you know what I'm saying? And so um, sometimes when you get somebody like a John Cena and you have somebody that has an eye for talent, you can already see a couple years ahead and go, all right, with a couple more years maturity, uh, right. you know, getting, you know, getting some time and rate with his promos, learning how to wrestle. This guy has all the tools to be a stud, you know what I'm saying? Let me tell you three others that come to mind, and maybe Chris can think of some others that Jimmy and Danny, or especially Jimmy, 
because uh, it was mainly his input I got. He did Who's not. Jimmy? Cornette. 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 Uh, okay. Cornette was booking OVW. At right. Night. And he did not think that Johnny Nitro would ever see a day in the WWE. He did, he did not think not Johnny Nitro had talent, which I thought from the most of the time he got here, he had the it factor. He might so not athletic. Had, he might not have had the size, but athletically he. But could didn't do. they didn't they start that M and M thing there? Mm -hmm. yep. That was under Heyman. Yeah, okay. Heyman, Heyman developed that. Didn't yeah, that was under he? Heyman, my yeah. bad. It might have been under Al, but it was under Al's. Heyman. And, uh, that was a good gimmick, bro. The paparazzi and wrong, the rolling yeah. red carpet and the and the and the fur coats and the girl in the middle. I don't know that anything down here got over any bigger than that, Chris. Can you think of anything? It, it wouldn't have been much. They were they were on top down here. They we everybody was. And it was one of the few things that we developed here that they kept full intact there, yeah. which blew us away because that rarely happened. Yeah, because normally they would tinker with it and screw with it, and then whatever it was when it got there was not what it was here. Right. Uh, but another one was Paul London. He didn't think Paul London had an ounce ounce of talent. Nigel McGinnis, he didn't like Nigel. I always thought Paul London had talent. Even Paul. I had I had gone to wrestle for Ring of Honor. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking maybe 2005, 2006, and I saw him there, and I was like, you know, yeah. I told Gabe, I go, this guy's very talented. I told him AJ Styles is very talented. One of the biggest pops that Chris ever had, because Chris really just being raised in the business, and he, he's been in wrestling rings since he was six weeks old. Um, the only people that I ever saw him just really mesmerized by meeting, and you're going to love the list here. Right. The first time that he got to meet Stone Cold Steve Austin, Steve took right. picnic table, and they talked about everything but wrestling for like an hour and a half. Right. Well, he's like the biggest star ever, him and The Rock. Yeah. I love yeah. Steve. He's great. Uh, then he got to meet The Undertaker for a period right. of time back, back when it was the original casket and the gloves. Right. The original Undertaker that we all know. Best That's gimmick right. ever. Oh, and, yeah. then, and then the other time that just blew him away, I never saw him melt more than he did in his life, is when I walked into the living room. I said, Chris, I have somebody I want you to meet because I'd heard him talk about him a hundred times. And I said, Chris, this guy wants to go to dinner with us tonight. Is that cool with you? And he just died that Paul London was in our living room. He loved Paul so much, and we got to be very dear friends with him, and, and just loved him immensely. Yeah, I was, was probably I was probably fourteen at the time when that happened, and it was like I had just kind of gotten into indie wrestling, and figured out what it was, and Paul was the guy that kind of got me watching that. Paul and Chris Daniels. Yeah. Oh my! And that was the other guy that Chris yeah. went to meet. I didn't get to see this meeting. Yeah, I had. Who to, was it that set up the tickets for us that uh, night for you to go? Pen, not Penzer. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, I, the I, promoter I, down in uh, down in the I, original T. I I feel really terrible about what I can't think of his name. I can't think of it either, but uh, I the should. guy who he was the guy who helped promote asylum shows in TNA. Burt Prentice. Yeah, Burt Prentice. Burt Prentice. Burt Prentice. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Let somebody could remember his name. Jeff Lane out of New York with a save. There, there. you go. But no, uh, when Chris got to go down to Nashville, I stayed home for this one. But Chris got to go down and meet Chris, uh, Christopher Daniels, and that was the that was Chris probably is a super cool dude. Oh, and he treated Chris like he gold did. That he night. really did. Yeah, I uh, I had been watching a lot of the Japanese Torimon and Michinoku stuff, seeing the uh, Japanese Lucha, and I'd seen Curry Man a lot, and I was just so in awe of this gimmick. Because in America, you had him doing this ultra serious, you know, evil priest thing, and then over there, he's just this nut in a mask, and I I loved it. I loved the gimmick so much; it was phenomenal to actually get to meet him at that age. Curry Man was my favorite. Uh, oh, Curry Man, that, that that was my favorite. That's a great all. gimmick. Oh yeah, and uh, it wasn't it Nigel McGinnis that saved you in Chicago from being yeah. stranded. You, you, we did, you didn't know him. He only knew of me. Yeah, he. Uh, and then when he said your Bowen's, your Penny Bowen's uh, son. No, I'll, I'll give you a ride home. And yeah, then that's how we got to be friends with Nigel. Yeah, some that Canadian he friends of mine ass. had a family emergency and couldn't drive back to Louisville. I rode up there with them, so they had to go back to Toronto. And I was stranded in Chicago, and McGinnis gave me a ride home. God bless him. Never had met man. the man in his life. Kind and, uh, man. Yeah, so and that's how we got to be friends with Nigel. And then we tried to infiltrate him into OVW, and Jimmy had him thrown out of the building because they heard that he had worked for Ian Rotten. So they had him thrown out of the building. So there's the Ian Rotten, too, <laughs> has heat. <laughs> oh, oh my god ian rodden has biblical it, heat it doesn't get any deeper with the heat with it i was so ashamed that i worked with them that uh, i went years and years and years without even saying his name uh isn't one of them passed away <sighs> axel passed away axel rotten right axel. Yeah, axel yeah axel passed away as chris said the day it happened the wrong rotten passed away yeah the wrong rotten died yeah that's heat wow that is that's heat, yeah. heat. um but doesn't that guy have something to do with uh um that Chris Rotten, what's his name? Not oh, Axel Rotten, the other guy. Ian Rotten? Ian Rotten. Isn't he in CZW? No. 
No, he uh, he was running IWA Mid South, but I think he's not involved anymore. Well, they he's got not... banned from Kentucky many moons ago. He, and still then run, I... he still runs in Indiana all the time. I heard they've been banned out of a lot of buildings in Indiana. They have, but they'll, they'll always many... find somebody. I mean, it's I you can't kill them there. They're cockroaches. Uh, so what is uh, who? What kind of talent are you having involved in Aero Lucha? Uh, we'll have some crash talent mixed in with uh, some American indie talent. Okay. And, uh, you know, mostly it's just going to be Lucha Libre. Like they want the people that are behind us because it's the Harris brothers and another guy, um, you know, they want it to be like uh, family friendly. And that's cool because one of the great things about Mexicans that I do like is like they have um, they have, you know, like we have a Mother's Day and a Father's Day. They have a kid's day, you know, and they also have like they're very family oriented in that. I'll give you an example. Um when I got older in my house and I still see this in a lot of households, like, you know, the family usually doesn't eat together. You know what I'm saying? One guy eats in his bedroom, the other guy eats at work, the other one, you know, very rare, you know, unless it's Thanksgiving or something like that, or a special occasion, you actually eat together where Mexico is like every day, everybody has to be at the table and eat together. So like when they go to the shows, it's very common to see the mom, the dad, the kids and the grandparents. You know what I'm saying? Even to this day, when I go to matches, I'll have, it's, you know, I'll have the granddad and the dad, you know, telling the kid that they watched me, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, wow, that, this is incredible. And so it's a really family, it's like a family thing, you know what I'm saying? And so they want it to be like family fair and you can have good wrestling for the family. You know, you don't have to, you know, do risque stuff to entertain people. How does the Mexican community feel about smartphones or phones in general at the dinner table? Oh yeah, they're not big fans of that at all. Right. No, like, like I know, I know that. Uh, like Ray Mysterio's wife, who's yeah. Mexican, right. you know, she's like has a no cell phone policy at her table. Fantastic! I love the woman. I love. <laughs> yeah. the, consider me yeah. an honorary Mexican. Yeah, yeah, Conan. Uh, you know, before we wrap up here, I was just curious because the news had come out, and I think it was a press release that you were writing the pilot. So, right. is this like going to be a pilot? to try and get TV and do you think the company needs TV to be successful or can, can it just, you know, stand on its own touring around? I don't know. I think that the TV, I think uh, TV is very helpful to anybody that wants to get to the next level. If not, you're kind of stuck at a certain level. Um, And I do think that um, invariably, you know, social media is going to take over TV right now is, is, um, um, the, the strongest media, <clears throat> but we're seeing a conversion over to social media. And uh, I think that um, to reach, you know, the biggest, uh, uh, how would be the best word to put it, the, your biggest magnitude of, of your audience, you're going to need social media or TV. So yeah, that would be helpful, but they're trying to build a model where you don't need TV to be successful. Well, it seems to be working for musicians. Musicians uh, used to be, you had to have that record label or you couldn't make it. Right, now they do it touring. Yeah, then Michael Moore uh, kind of uh, started this independent uh, thing. There, and was, there was independent guys before that. I hate to, I hate you to, always bury Michael Moore. It's because he has Come no on. talent. I, well, hate, I like Michael Moore. I hate, to, I hate to say it, but ICP probably started that. Tech 9 was a big part of the uh, no-label movement. I'm not E40 big... was another guy who was a major player and not having a label. And Michael Moore. No, no, ICP did an incredible job of that. But so do you, good. That's a good one, bro. E four O. How would you know about that? I uh, <laughs> I uh, I'm a big hip hop production nerd. I uh, right. I wonder where I found him at times. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Uh, I love a lot of uh, hip hop production. I like I like beats. I like kind of figuring out who's producing what. I was a huge fan of NERD. I think Pharrell Williams has become hackneyed and sold out. I love I love happy. Yeah, bro. He just became commercial. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Pitbull Cuban, yeah, uh-huh. from Miami. If you listen to his early, sh- it's oh, yeah. raw, badass gangster. Oh, sh- and 2000, now, 2002, yeah, he was a totally different musician. Then he started doing all that. Oh, this I didn't, sh- I didn't yeah, really know of Pitbull until he started performing with Usher, yeah, <laughs> with Neo like, yeah. and Usher and Calle Ocho and all that. And it's like he just went commercial. Wow. I'm, yeah. a, I'm a big Usher fan, so I kind of got him by by default. One of my favorite rappers out of Miami recently in the last couple of years is a guy named Ghost Rider. He's yeah. uh, he was on, I like Ghost Rider. I've, yeah, I've was, heard a lot of stuff. He was on uh, Po'boy like. Hiram, uh, same as what's his damn name, uh, Flo Rida. Didn't he talk? Right. 
Twitter here yeah, a while back. Yeah, I yeah. talked to him a little bit on Twitter. Like that's another guy, Flow Rider to me is turned commercial, bro. Yeah, completely, completely. Well, see, his commercial stuff is the only thing I know of. Yeah, so, but, but, but I like that's it. what makes him the money, bro. They're making yeah, big, big money. money. Like yeah. I met early on in his career, he was a big wrestling fan, Daddy Yankee. He used to go to Puerto Rico to the shows, and he's super commercial now. Oh, oh yeah, yeah he, he was a, he was a big featured act on a couple of the WWE shows, if I remember correctly. Flow Rider was. Yeah, uh, I want to hear his opinion on. You think he's the greatest uh, of all, uh, uh, Kanye? I think Kanye's the greatest producer of all time. Overall, uh, I how think. do you feel about that? Yeah, he's a great producer. I don't know if of, of all time, but he's a great producer. If I, all time, you know, you, better than Quincy Jones. It, oh, I love Quincy Jones. Be better, tough- than, better than Prince. I would put him on the same level as Prince just for the influences on music. If you listen to the first three Kanye West albums, right? I hate to actually say this because the first three, I think, were revolutionary. The way they took the soul beats and kind of modified them, right? I think nobody was thinking about that. But I think that when you go to 808s and Heartbreak, the fourth one, I think that that's the one that has been aped so much in so many other people's music. You hear it in so many different genres. I hear it in, I hear elements of it in country, I hear elements of it in pop. It's been stolen, that 808s, that down-tempo, that methodical drone kind of music. I hate that that's the one that really caught on, but that's been his most lasting impression. What was our big argument, Chris, about who uh, was a bigger deal in music, Michael Jackson or Kanye West? No, I said who's had more lasting, in who has impressed upon music more. I still say Michael Jackson by a landslide. You don't hear a lot of the progressions of Michael Jackson's music. You don't hear the vocal styles outside of a few guys who are trying to steal his style basically a uh, weekend is copied michael jackson but we- yeah uh, as a matter of fact i thought he, that's what he was trying to do was but if you don't jackson have but if you story. listen to weekend without daft punk producing him he's not nearly the artist that i wouldn't even put him over as being part of that michael jackson movement he needs such a strong production to sound like anything yeah i don't know michael jackson was just to me more of a total performer you know what yeah. i'm saying he was a greater performer than kanye yeah. i don't think anybody that's a greater performer than michael but to say that his musical style has lasted longer. I, I can't give him that. There's not a lot of people doing the thriller style of music of doing the oh, bad. bro. Cause that's like that's 30 years. Remember. That's like 30 years old. Yeah, exactly. It, it hasn't really hung in. I mean, and Kanye yeah. might not last that long now, but the world I live in now is certainly right. some heartbreak influence. And I'm also a diehard and I just went to their sold out concert in Louisville last year. Uh, Christopher's uh, wife uh, took me um, earth, wind and fire. How do you feel? Uh, about yeah. One of the greatest groups that ever, ever existed first of all incredible horn section oh, second of all great afro cuban beats oh and Third, performing with chicago right yeah. oh that's awesome too we'll get to them in a second thirdly i'm just going to say one name philip bailey and then i'm going to say another name maurice white and that's oh. all you need to know about earth wind and one of the greatest groups that ever existed fire and i'm also uh, chris says i have a man crush on Bernie and white um, now, before we get to Birdie and White, what do you think of Earth, Wind, and Fire, Chris? It's not my style of music, but I respect them. Like, I respect what they do. I think that if I was older, I would probably be able to connect with it more. Yeah. What it is, and I understand the influence and how great it is, but it's just not what I listen to in tell, my free Tell them at the time how your 19-year-old wife felt about being the youngest person at the Yum Center to see Earth, Wind, and Fire in Chicago and what her feelings were after leaving this group that she'd never really heard of before. Like I said, she grew up in East Germany, so the musical taste over there is quite a bit different. But right. she was bored by it. She had never really heard anything like that or seen that kind of, uh, how would I describe it? She'd never really seen that type of assembly of music. And she was so impressed and so floored by the guys at that age still performing at that level. And Conan, I had not seen them, and I know Jeff's ready to kill me for how long we've gone, but uh, I had not seen Earth, Wind & Fire live since the 70s. And then she right. got great tickets for this show uh, through an attorney that she worked for. And I, I literally sat there with tears in my eyes for almost every song because a lot of the songs they did, I saw in the seventies, you link them with old girlfriends or what have you, <clears throat> or they're just great songs that just bring back great memories. And I swear I sat there with tears in my eyes, probably through 80% of the concert. Yeah. Back then it was the, now, especially yeah. in Chicago. Probably, first record I ever bought feeling stronger every day was the first 45 I ever bought. And I played it so much. I wore it gray and then to see them blend with Earth, Wind, and Fire, which I saw at uh, the Greek theater. Was Peter Cetera singing or no? Uh, w- back when I started following him, Peter Cetera was. Yeah, the, no, but when you saw him now, no? No, 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 no. He was, uh, uh, Peter hasn't been with them for a long time. Have you? I, what do you think of Chicago, Chris? I'm really not even that aware of them. I haven't heard too much of their music. That's, you know who they are, Jeff? 
Yeah, I was never into him. How about Earth, Wind, and Fire? Love Earth, Wind, and Fire. Let's Groove is one of my favorite like music what videos favorite? ever. Like that video is awesome. Yeah, the video is awesome. The music's awesome. Uh, but I like a lot of their stuff that didn't become hits. A song called Running. I bet you know what Running is. Yeah. Running. And um, uh, God, uh, Calypso. And from back then, you probably liked the Commodores, right? I liked the Commodores, but nowhere near to the level that I liked Earth, Wind, and Fire. I also liked uh, the Brothers Johnson. Cool in the uh, gang. Letter 23. Um, I Letter 23. And uh, that song, to me, still holds up to this day. I can listen to that song every single day. But the Brothers Johnson, uh, the Gap Band, I liked a lot back then. I was right. a huge, huge case in the Sunshine Band, Mark. Uh, they were Hialeah, great. Hialeah, Hialeah, right. What a, what a what a great sound. And that talk about a horn section and oh, talk about a, a white boy with soul. <laughs> Den, Denville Littrot was one. I got to meet him and have dinner with him at a casino here in uh, in Louisville, well, in Indiana. I believe it was in 2001, 2002. And only 10 of us got to have dinner with him. And he couldn't believe that I was naming all of his old horn section and his band members. And I said, by the way, I said, uh, Furman Guadasolo, is he still with me? He says, you know the name Furman Guadasolo? He said, he's still with me. He's been with me for 40 years. And, they, I, and I got to have dinner with him, too. Do, they you, call him in. do you like KC, uh, Chris? Uh, I like some of their music. He's pushed it down my throat so yeah. much, I, I could not hear it again and be satisfied. It was always in the car. Yeah, I, I got burned out on them at a young age, but I do. It's I, almost I, like our boy Road Dog. Every time I got in his car, it was Elvis. I was like, <laughs> all right, I kind of like the guy, but this is too much. Yeah, too yeah, much. So well, now what did your girlfriend think about Yeezy since she'd never heard him either? I had to introduce her to him. She didn't grow up. Oh, he wasn't big in Germany either? He was, but she oh. wasn't a big rap fan. She got into that through okay. me. She's come around to where now she adores him. and She, like, she I, does. I wear Yeezy shoes. Like That's all I wear. He does. Um, but And everybody that we go out, whenever, whenever we go to dinner, everyone's looking at Chris's shoes, and I just don't get that. I don't understand it. Right. I, I'm, I'm a big shoe guy. Now, but, where do you get them from? Because they're expensive. Do you get them online? Maya was flirting with a girl at the New York Adidas uh, flagship in Fifth Avenue. It worked out good for you. Yeah, and I kind of <laughs> started talking to her, and now I kind of get, I kind of get a deal, as they yeah, say. Yeah, I get, I get a hookup on them. I still pay more than retail, but not a whole lot. So yeah, well, that's good. That's, kind of that's a good shoe, comfortable, right? Ray Mysterio oh. wears them a lot. Yeah, oh, damn, it so makes me mad because it looks like the world's most comfortable it, shoe, it really but I can't is. get them in my size. No, I've never no. seen them in my size. No, I don't go up that high. Yeah. You wouldn't pay what it costs to get them anymore. I would not, no. So, but no, they, they're incredibly comfortable. I wouldn't I even pay your price. <laughs> um, but no, they're damn comfortable. Um, but no, she's got, she listens to a lot of Kanye now. She really has gotten into his first three, like I said, uh, Dropout, Late Registration, and Graduation. Uh, I, I would put those albums up against anything anybody's done. If you listen to like the way they flow together, if you listen to how it's arranged, it's just those albums are perfect. I can't think of anybody who's outdone that. And Jeff's yeah. going to kill me again, but before we go, I got to know what your thoughts are. I think it's one of the greatest things ever done in college football. What do you think of the turnover chain? Yeah, that's Miami, bro. That's, that's straight up Miami. Why that was that not there in the day, man? That is yeah. the greatest thing to give these players something. Every down, I want that chain. I want that chain. And all you got to do is motivate people with the stupidest stuff. When I was in sales and marketing, everybody was just bullshit and they weren't getting the job done. You know what motivated everybody? Well, whoever the top sales team is gets a free pizza party at the end of the week. They went nuts for 40 bucks worth of damn pizza. You just need something to motivate. And I think the turnover chain is the greatest thing uh, that I've seen in college football in quite some time. The, to motivate those players on every down, I want that damn chain. I, I would like to say that the greatest thing I've seen on the show is, I, what is the little thing that's on your other side, Jeff? It <laughs> looks like... Uh, says lost <laughs> underneath loss that that's, yeah. that's newman from seinfeld vince got me that one year <laughs> you know what's pissing me off i've got a house full of shit here i've got banners and monitors a rolling scroll that the the chantel made for me i've got everything and he hadn't noticed one damn i got a miami dolphin cover no, your stuff is on my coffee. well yeah I'm, right you got, me there. you got me there when i know what your stuff is i don't know what jeff's stuff is <laughs> Conan, you know? Question I wanted to ask you one more guy. Yeah. We we're talking about guys who Jeff, Jeff has a gun to his head. Who right we now. thought should have made it. Um, the main guy that came to my mind out of Mexico, who I'm shocked never even got a look here, was Shocker. Uh, what do you think? I heard you he did get him? a look. He 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 did get a look. Dusty Rhodes had seen him in a Burger King commercial, right? Okay. I'm serious. Dusty oh. Rhodes saw him in a Burger King commercial, had no clue if he could work. 
but he had such a great look because he had like the Mexican bronze skin yeah. and he had like platinum hair, yeah. you know, I've and got so, to see this commercial. Yeah. So he brought him, he brought him to TNA and after he brought him, he asked me, he goes, can this guy work? And I go, yes, he can work, you know? And so shocker who, when he was young, was about as charismatic as anybody out there and was a great, great worker, bro. You know, little by little, bro, I mean, he started to become irresponsible because he started to fall into some of the vices that a lot of guys have. Yeah. And I remember one day he didn't show up, so they brought Alex Shelley in. I'll never forget this. They brought Alex Shelley in, who I didn't know had been trained by Skyda, who's yeah, a great – was the dancer, right? Skyda is – no, Alex – that's Alex, right? Alex oh. Shelley was the guy with the camera. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, Scott, Chris Sabin's partner. Gaida is, I'm glad you brought him up because he yeah. is so underrated. He right. just he used to work for me in Promo Azteca, bro. Really? So anyways, so Skyde had gone up to, I think to might be Mike Quackenbush's place over there. Uh, what's uh, that Chikara. place called? Chikara. Chikara. Yeah. And he was training a lot of guys and one of them was Alex Shelley. So Shocker had missed a show. And so they brought Alex Shelley in just in case he missed another one. And, uh, and so he showed up late. I'll never forget it. And he went into the ring with Alex Shelley and Shelley ate his lunch up, not in a disrespectful way, no, but yeah. just ate his lunch up. And he just, you know, started to get bigger, bigger into his vices to, um, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you knew that lately he had broken his jaw. No, and he, he was wearing like this thing to kind of keep his jaw together. Like he's a wreck, bro. And he, he, he was just arrested not too long ago for like, you know, trashing a hotel room and like not paying a prostitute. And like, he's, he's Wait, really taking a little, you could be arrested for not paying a prostitute. Yeah. In Mexico. Yeah, bro. All right, man. Yeah. That's, I, that's a shame to hear. Good, because good thing I, to know. Because when I first got in at about 2001, that guy, he looked like he couldn't miss. He had the, yeah, movement, he was great. He had the movements he had. He was great. Just phenomenal. Yeah. I'm very sad that it's turned out that way. Jeff yeah. Wayne, did you know that you could be arrested for not paying a prostitute? Now, no, but I'm writing that down for uh, right for now. future knowledge. For your vacation to Mexico. Yeah, don't, don't pay, the yeah. pay the prostitutes. Pay the prostitutes. Conan right. or Jeff Lane goes on a shooting spree at his local grade school. Um, <laughs> I think we need to end this thing. But man, it has been yeah. such a pleasure having you on. I'd love to do this again sometime. One last thing. I want to see how deep into the culture he goes. <laughs> now. Right has the gun and he's got bullets in it um nate colbert does that name ring a bell with you yeah wasn't he a baseball player for the san diego padres padres and he holds a record that's never been broken to this day he hit five home runs and a double header back in the 70s and yeah. somehow that has not been broken with all the people that have hit in four home runs in a game uh cincinnati red scooter uh scooter Jeanette. you ain't afraid to bring up like denner miller-esque trivia you know, like, <laughs> well, Gary Templeton was a big star for the yeah uh, shortstop for the Padres. Tony Gwynn, I absolutely he invents love. grill each other about baseball quite a bit. Oh, and I, this I did not know until this week. Somehow I did not know that Michael Irvin's kid now plays for the Miami Hurricanes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's how old I am. <laughs> now the now the people I rooted for as kids have kids playing, and I'm still watching them on television. So with that, I guess we should probably let. Uh, yeah, well, before you before you take us home, Kenny Conan's got to tell everybody about keeping it one hundred and Impact. Oh, You're still with Impact. Yeah. Everything you got going on there. Whatever. Yeah, Impact is on Thursdays on Pop TV. I'm on Conan K O double N A N five one five zero on both um, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, I have a podcast called Keeping It One Hundred, and um, my co-host is a uh, Disco Inferno. And um, we always have every week. We have Shane Hel We have Shane Helms on the Hurricane. We have oh, Juventud Hooven Guerrera, and um, who? Oh, uh, we have this thing called the Mass Republic Minute, where we talk about lucha with a uh, lucha guy, uh, Kevin Kleinrock. And we'll have guests from uh, now and then. We like to talk about you know everything from sports to TV to current topics to um everything wrestling everything and we just you know it's a, it's a good time check it out we've had jeff lane on before we've had vince russo we're gonna have to get you guys on in the future oh we love, love it love to and you got yeah. gertner on there now as well yeah we got well 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 gertner on starting off the show we had to take the snowflake out kg bro <laughs> 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 well now that i know jeff lane's been on at least i don't have to be embarrassed about being a guest That's yes right. you, won't uh, be, you won't be the least <laughs> over guy on the show yeah yes 
But, bro, I have to put you over because uh, I remember when when you had the little feud with uh, KG. Right. And uh, then you would always play Snowflake. Snowflake, Snowflake, little Snowflake. That was awesome. <laughs> well, somebody's going to have to help me out. Who's KG? Kevin Gill. You- yeah, he was this guy that was a host on my show, and he had a he had a he had a running feud with me, and then he had a running feud for a little while with um with Jeff, and then for a little while with Vince too. You hate it when the hosts get heat with each other. That that's not good. Yeah, well, he had heat with me, so at the end of the day, <laughs> he had to go have heat with your own talent. Yeah, that 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 thins it out a little bit. Well, I've I've been known to go through a few hosts, and uh, the fact that I made it three shows with Jeff might be a bit of a miracle. I'd uh, been through five or six five, now, depending on all this. This should be uh, episode five and six. So if you try to do graphics of all the random uh, older <laughs> Mexican talent that Conan and I were mentioning, oh, this, this could be very fun. I will watch yeah. it. See what you do with the graphics. Yeah. <laughs> hey, man, you know a lot about your Lucha Libre. I'm impressed. Thank you very much for supporting something that, you know, I've dedicated most of my uh, life to to pushing because I always thought it was a. Uh, I don't, you know, yeah, it doesn't have much psychology, but it wasn't meant to. Uh, psychology is when you have a mask versus mask or hair versus hair match or something important. You know, our belief, my belief has always been, you know, let the horses run, let the birds fly. These kids are young and they can do incredible stuff. They're not going to be able to do when they're 40 years old because they're going to learn how to work smarter. So let them do, do what they can do while they're young. And, you know, that's why I've always loved Lucha Libre because they just go out there and they just create and innovate and the match is fun. You know what I'm saying? It's artistic. It's a uh, it's a performance art. My biggest pop of the night is whenever Chris would throw up a reference that you were just blown away that he knew, and you'd say, "How the hell do do you know about that?" And of course, I'm sitting here saying the same thing. Uh, he's when he gets into something, man, he gets into yeah, it. Yeah, no, he's very knowledgeable. Good stuff, man. We'll we'll talk some more. You know what I'm saying? I can't wait. I want to talk to you uh, in the future about how uh, guys in Mexico tend to have longer careers despite working a harder style. I've always been curious about that and how that works. That that would be interesting. How guys like. Uh, Atlantis are still holding on, so uh, right. I'd, I'd love to get into that with you one of these days, man. Hopefully, we'll have you back on before too much longer. All right. Well, thank you very much, man, for having me on your show, and it's good to see you, Jeff. Nice to meet you, Kenny, Chris. Good to see you, well, man. It's been an All honor. Right. All right. It's been an honor to do yours, man. You say the word, and we'll be there. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great night, man. Thank have you. Have a good night. Right. You too. Much. Peace.